This is episode 72 of Let's Talk Geek, Tigra 3 Modern Warfare My Gaming. We get the lowdown about the gaming news from My Gaming. We give away a fancy looking camera. Flash for mobile is dead, can you believe it? And SA Banks use fingerprints. Thanks for watching. Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 72. Uh, in this episode with us today, we have James. How's it going? Hi, how are you? Good, good, good cool. to have you here. Um, Jan? Good evening. And Derek? How's it, Tim? How are you doing? Good. All three from my broadband. Slash my gaming. Uh, James and Derek are both from my gaming, or that part of it. Mm. And then, of course, myself, Tim Hawk, and as usual, the mixer. Um, let's actually get into our topics quite quickly. We, we're skipping because I've got to do the dates. But anyway, <laughs> um, Google Plus finally launched Pages, uh, which has been waiting for, the, for quite a while. It's nice, but it has a couple of flaws. Yeah. Um, the person who creates the page is the admin. You cannot have any other admins. Yes, this is a problem because we've created a page for my broadband that we're going to actually have to delete because it's linked to somebody's personal Google account. So we've got a separate account, and we're going to use that yeah. instead. Um, it's, it's a big issue, actually. Now, fortunately, Which they'll, they'll probably fix. I'm sure they're going to fix it at some point. Unfortunately, the account we created ours with. So by the way, Let's Talk Network does have an account, um, and so does Altio Frequence. Um, the, the idea is that Afrikaans will be fully in Afrikaans. Um, the Let's Talk Network will cover all the other shows as well. So, you know, please feel free to go out and plus one uh, the Let's Talk <laughs> Network uh, Google Plus page. Um, it's quite nice. It seems to work well. One thing I do like about them, which uh, Facebook doesn't do, I can switch between my profile and the page profile uh, when I'm on the page. So, yeah, because now I can't comment on our Facebook page without it officially coming from my broadband. Yes. So I can't, you know, climb on a thread and go, lol. You know what idiots, um, because then it'll look like I'm the one. Yeah, my broadband's, my broadband's going, passing the comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you can, with this one you can. It's quite nice. It's very easy. That just on the left, you just click, and then you can go to the other profile. Um, so once they do add admins, it's going to be very, very nice. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys, have played around with this at all. No, no, not, not at all. Embarrassing enough, I've not signed up for Google Plus, and we do have my gaming Google Plus page. Uh, in the works, but uh, I can't even give you the address at the moment because okay. I don't know it's what it is. It's quite nice being Google. Uh, the mm -hmm. search actually works very, very well. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, in Facebook you can actually have a URL with your page and if you've got enough followers. This doesn't work quite the same, so there's nothing like that. But if you just pump in my, my gaming into it, it's going to search and, and find okay. the page yeah. quite easily. Um, other than that, it's pretty boring. Um, <laughs> it's not much else. Uh, before you can speak to people, they need to have added you to their circles and you can add them into other circles. Um, it's, yeah, not much more to say about that. No, um, I, I think they just had to get into this fairly quickly. So it's interesting to see how long it's taken them to get this. Six months. Yeah, very, it, I mean, it's fairly limited functionality if you think about it. Um, and I, I think that there was maybe a lot of back-end stuff that they wanted to do because in the beginning they were hopping on real names only, please. Yeah. Um, and I, I know it's because this was coming, um, but uh, it's... It took it, a very long time with the hard stance on real names. Yeah. Though I still think that's part of the, the ploy that they want more real people on there. So they wanted to limit the businesses and people creating other profiles instead of creating profiles for themselves. So I think there, there might have been a, a purposeful delay yes. in bringing out the pages. Because um, even still now, I don't know if you know, so the APIs now let you pull data out, but there's no APIs as yet to put data into Google+. And I think that's also a way of stopping it becoming a Twitter, just feeding your Twitter but, feed but into it. But for a stuff. publisher, I mean, this means that we have to now, I mean, we're not in Gadget, um, yeah. so we don't have 40 a 40 strong mm. and more mm. staff complement. So now we've got to get somebody to post content on a daily basis to the Google Plus page, otherwise it's going to stay blank. Um, so if, if there's no auto automated feed into, into that well, and I somehow, agree with that. I think at some point they're going to do it. I think they're just delaying it because we saw what happened with Buzz. Is everybody just started to feed uh, Twitter, Twitter into that? And if you go on there and all you're seeing is people's tweets, you're going to stop paying attention. Well, Buzz, yeah, Buzz was junk. Um, so, <laughs> must we were at the Google uh, event last week, and they were pushing Plus very, very heavily. Uh, like, but we also picked up one or two bugs in, in the uh, mobile client while we were there. That they keep thinking, oh, just click on the hashtag. It's like not on the mobile client. <laughs> but anyway, but, but very nice event. Incredibly interesting what, what's coming up and what you can do with the stuff. Um, from then, something a bit more local. Uh, banks 
couple of them I, I know F&B and apps are both of it is fingerprint verification yes um, and this is I actually thought it was them doing their own fingerprint verification but it's not it's actually tying directly into, into the government database yes and, and in order for it to really work um, you know the way that they that they've built it to work uh, I mean just based on the press releases I've not actually seen it in action we were yeah. invited yeah. Uh, we were just unavailable um, you you basically they can verify your identity against a government database. That means that they don't have to worry about data sanitation. It doesn't have to mean they have to worry about data verification mm. in a perfect system. Well, this is a government-controlled database. We, yeah. we must remember that. Um, but, yeah, so otherwise, I mean, Capitech has had fingerprint verification for a long time, if I'm not mistaken. They, they enroll you when you open your account, and then whenever you go in and you want to transact, you just – Verify yourself via fingerprint. But that's different. You can't open an account on a fingerprint like that. Mm. Now, what they've, what Absa and FNB have done is you can physically open an account with, um, your, with fingerprint verification. So, um, is this a way of sort of getting around FICA and proving who you are? And I, I think it's just all feeding into, into that whole system. So, and, and to prevent identity theft. And they, I mean, Absa in their press release, they said that they caught at the seven branches that they piloted, they caught seven people opening accounts with fraudulent ID books. Very cool. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, very funny, I would think, as well, <laughs> when you go in to open your fraudulent account and then they whip out the new fingerprint verification I'm part of the process. I'm surprised at that point you don't go, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I need to leave now. Yeah, yeah, urgent <laughs> I'm feeling a bit call. sick, you know. Mm. Um, but, you know, some people – one thing, though, one of the interesting things, though, they did say there will be no sharing of information back. So that's one thing I know a lot of people worried about. This is plugging into Home Affairs. They're going to stop pulling out all my records from Home Affairs and then deciding, you know, should I get a loan or not mm. from that. Um, and they say this is pretty much it sends through the fingerprint, an ID number, and it comes back with a yes or no. That's what they want you to think. No, look, I'm sure on the home affairs <laughs> side they're recording a whole ton more because now it's like, oh, this person's been to the bank. <laughs> you know, there is a lot more in there. But I would imagine on the bank side, I know home affairs, the people tend to deal with home affairs and in those areas tend to be quite – I'm supposed to be quite scary. <laughs> I'm not sure how, how much I'm allowed to say, yeah. um, but we worked on a, on my Saab days. We worked on a project that included Harness, and so we needed to do Harness integration. I'm like, great, give me a database schema, give me a, a link to at least a trial database. Jeez, like I couldn't get anything out of them because I mean, obviously they don't want us to work on the live data. Um, and uh, but we were supposed to be responsible for putting the intermediary database. So you've got the live database yeah. that then needs to replicate to our working database because mm -hmm. we're going to need to write records into it. Uh, people will be able to enroll, and it's, it's this is for useful cops. So if the cops need to be able to use the system, they need to be able to write data to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't get written to the master system. It gets written to an intermediary system. It's almost like a note, a note attached to Yes, exactly. So that was, that was how they wanted to do it. But getting anything, they're like, hi, why is the link not done yet? I'm like, I don't know what your database looks like. What the hell? Anyway. Cool. <laughs> That's a life and times of a techie. <laughs> it's always fun when you're enduring with uh, you know, heavy governmental security. It's like... Yeah, we, we need you to help us do this thing. It's like, cool, just give me the information I need. Oh, sorry, we can't do that. It's like, <laughs> then I can't help you. <laughs> well, must like, I no, but you must, have to. Must it's I like, divine how this thing works? <laughs> but cool. Anyway, moving swiftly along. Cool. Um, all right. Do you want to get into the events first or do you want to do that at the end? I, I forgot to add events, so we'll do that near the end. <laughs> all right. Because <laughs> I need to look them up quickly. Um, okay. Uh, part of the thing today, we've got the, my gaming guys with us. Um, and that would be James and Derek. So I'm just going to get you guys to give us a bit more rundown of who you are, uh, where people can find you, what you do like on a daily basis. James, you want to start with you? Sure. Uh, well, you know, hi, everyone. I'm James, uh, my gaming editor. Um, took over from Nick Simmons. Uh, yes, you know, recently promoted. Yeah. Uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants and all that good stuff. Uh, he was at the helm for almost three years. Uh, so, you know, the site's been running for... Well, since uh, early 2009, I think it was. And um, so, obviously, gaming news site, uh, find us at mygaming.co.za. And, you know, our, our goal really is uh, to bring international news to a local audience and also do lots of uh, well, local Cover stuff. the local stuff. Yes, exactly. I, I know um, you guys were going to talk about it just now, some local mm -hmm. gaming servers. Um, exactly. There was Rage. I know Derek was running around there quite a bit. And of course, we have great support from you know my broadband as well in terms of you know r the technical stuff, speaking to uh, you know all the ISPs and the guys you need to know in the industry to you know really tackle those angles of uh, the local gaming 
uh, right. scene. So, yeah, and moving forward, I mean, that that is just our goal. Keep growing. Just and get more uh, and get yeah, more, more the local know, gaming draw scene. Draw more, more people into our community. You know, we have a lot of fun, lots of cool discussions on our forums. So, yeah, a lot of fun working there. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, Derek? Well, yeah, I recently also just joined my broadband, my gaming. Um, so I started off at my broadband and then sort of moved over to my gaming. Um, I'm the hardware guy. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I know you, you're doing a quick review. We've got a video review without doing overclocking and. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I, I tend to do all sorts of all, all sorts of uh, different types of hardware, um, mostly gaming related. I try and relate it back to gaming. Uh, majority PC, but every now and then a console will slip in. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a PC gamer at heart, and yeah, um, that's about it for me. Cool. And where can people find you directly? Twitter. Okay, yeah, my Twitter account, James underscore E underscore S, and uh, that's pretty much the, the main route if you want to catch me during the day, you know, I'm sitting there at tweet decks, you know, on my one monitor, and I'll, I'll respond straight away. Uh, otherwise, email me at james at mygaming.co.za. Cool. Uh, is there a My Gaming Twitter account? There is. Uh, it is at My Gaming. Cool. Same thing for me here, um, also on My Gaming, uh, also, uh, on my gaming uh, so it's Derek at mygaming.co.za. Uh, Twitter as well, at Derek Kramer. Uh, also, same thing Derek, as Derek, two R's, I-C-K. Yeah, everyone gets it wrong. <laughs> and uh, Kramer with a C, not a K, as some people are cool. you know, guilty of and he's spelling looking, my name. Uh, and he's looking at me. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going <laughs> to point at anyone here. But. <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to know how to spell that, all the links are on our wiki. So wiki.altinet.tv. Just there's a link to guests, and you can find the, the what, what they look like um, <laughs> with... with uh, just the, the buyers and stuff like that. Um, cool. Do you guys were wanting to talk about Modern Warfare 3 has been launched? Um, uh, sure. I mean, uh, that's obviously the big game this week, Modern Warfare 3. Uh, you know, Battlefield was <coughs> so last week already, so yeah. I'm I, I, Modern I, Warfare 3 now. And um, Big launch event yesterday, right? Yes. Uh, our other new journalist, Quentin, uh, went to the launch event uh, hosted by Megarom, had a lot of fun, played some sort of paintball games, mm. and did some team building, drove around in Jeeps, and cool. uh, generally had a good time. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, all the local ISPs have now uh, come on board. Um, we've got Web Africa, Internet Solutions, uh, Telcom, uh, Cyrix Game Services, iGame, uh, who of course are you know, part of our forum, um, and who am I forgetting? MWeb, of course. Uh, you know, the five main guys there have uh, all climbed on board and got dedicated servers running cool. for everyone to join. Um, you know, one of the little niggles with the dedicated servers was mm -hmm. the the fact that you don't level progress uh, when you're playing on a dedicated server. Um, you can only do that uh, level up your soldier or your character as cool. it were. It's, so yeah, I'm coming a bit from a, a new, newbie thing here with modern warfare and all the rest of it. I know with the MMOs how you level up and all the rest of it, but but in the sh shooter games, sure. How does does it work on a similar principle? Or? Uh, well, not similar. I suppose similar in a way. I mean, it's probably very grindy uh, in that you just have to keep going at it and then suddenly you can unlock that silencer for your sniper rifle or whatever the, the case may be. So there's sort of weapons mods, new guns, um, decals for your weapons, all sorts of stuff that just improves your soldier through his uh, career, as they call it, okay. um, up to the max level. I can't quite remember what it is in Modern Warfare 3. I'm sure somebody's already hit max level. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Games have been out guys for a few hours. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and what's this? I know last week the guys were raving about uh, Battlefield 3. They, they were mm -hmm. loving it. Yeah. Um, what's the comparison like so far? Uh, a comparison in what sense? I mean, what are the people this saying is a about very modern difficult warfare? topic to address. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I say that's. Uh, yeah. I'm not quite into. into well, uh, you definitely have your modern warfare camp and your battlefield camp, and the modern warfare guys. Um, you know, uh, really, so, so, so are both sides are happy saying the other guys are wrong. Yeah, exactly. And okay. um, you know, you get a lot of that in gaming. And, you know, whether it's PS3 versus Xbox or whatever, and PC Master Race just looking down at everyone gloating, or uh, Battlefield 3 versus Modern Warfare 3. So Modern Warfare 3 is more of a run and gun sort of shooter uh, less teamwork involved um uh, so it's more of an individual sort of yeah. fun time uh it's got a bad reputation for having a lot of sort of uh, younger player base who likes to swear at you over chat but you know i played a lot of online games over the years and i don't think uh that's any different for any game. You mean really. they all, all so, have that Dota. Yes, uh, I think the Lol. only difference being that in Battlefield 3 they didn't implement uh, VoIP built into the game. So guys are actually hosting a TeamSpeak server and just okay. getting together with their friends in the game. So it's already people that you know and you're li less likely to swear at your friends. Mm. Well, more likely, funny. I'm not quite yeah. sure. Well, and uh, also if it's your friend swearing, you're used to him swearing maybe. Exactly. And then so you, you can swear back and you don't feel like it's you know, in bad spirits. Mm. It's all in good fun. So Battlefield 3 is more of uh, the tactical gamer shooter, uh, if you would believe the arguments on the internet. And... Um, you know, more more squad based uh, sort of teamwork involved, objectives to uh, to meet and so on. Cool, 
All right. Um, I just want to ask, so what's your guys' things on, on the, the local game servers? Like, I can mm-hmm. see over the past like two years or so, it's actually been suddenly, appear, well, from my experience, appearing and getting more and more mm-hmm. um, and, and helping quite a bit. Are you guys finding it's helping with the games, with latency and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, that? definitely. I mean, it's going to help. Um, you know, previously, if you had to connect an international server, you're going to look at uh, a good 200 milliseconds yeah. ping just getting to the server. And then, you know, you get all the traffic from all the other players. Who knows where they are? Uh, so, yeah, you, you'll for FPS games, really not good at all. So, you know, with the local ISPs really coming on board, you know, they see it as a way to attract customers. And, you know, it's great because the gamers win and uh, we all have a good time. And, uh, yeah, so the local ISPs are, you know, really coming on board with that sort of stuff lately. Cool, cool. Um, one of the things, I know you guys have done a review on it. I was mm-hmm. going to talk about the Batman game. Yes. A um, bit more. Uh, I've been playing, playing it a bit more. I played a tiny bit. Life is busy, so you don't get <laughs> that much time with it. I don't mm-hmm. know if you guys have... I must agree. I know you guys are both waiting for the PC version of it. Yes, yeah. exactly. The um, collector's edition, and which has been delayed. Uh, again, maybe a quick news update, news flash. Batman Arkham City on PC has been delayed in South Africa yet again. We're looking at maybe uh, the 2nd of December or, let me just check my calendar, or the 25th. Depends. That's bad for Christmas sales. Yes, uh, depends. Um, 25th internationally, so if you bought it on Steam, you're going to get it on the 25th. That was just the international delay for whatever reason. And um, now the local distributor, New Metro, is trying to get all the product in, but very busy season, trying to get stuff on planes, you know, cargo and all that can be quite difficult. So... Uh, hopefully, it'll be here by the 25th, but they're, they're saying the 2nd of December just to be on the safe side. Okay. The 25th of November. Yes. Sorry, I heard December there. That's no, 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 thinking. sorry. That's, that's a <laughs> 25th of November, uh, 2nd of December. Okay, at the, cool. At the latest. And I must say, I've been playing them all. It's not generally the type of game I, I enjoy that much, but mm-hmm. the more I've been playing, the more I've actually been enjoying and getting a bit addicted, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm very excited. I it's, can't wait. It's, it's yeah. good. And, and compared to the previous one, it's, it's mm. considerably better. I'm sure, um, and, and bigger, just uh, more characters to way check Way bigger, out. way more characters. Um, and one of the things I've, I've noticed is normally when these big worlds, I feel like I've spent so much time running from one point to another, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, and I'm, I'm not getting that feeling with this one. Yes. There's, there's things happening, and you do get sidetracked every now and again, but it's, it's, it feels like it's part of the system. And, and Definitely. Very good game design from yeah. uh, Rocksteady there. They, they give you enough to do in between uh, doing main quests or even side quests. Mm. There's Riddler's challenges to find or even I think it's random encounters uh, sort of where there'll be a guy getting beaten up by other yeah, thugs they'll, and you they'll can be choose to go and rescue Do that him. and then you can pull up the map and you can actually see where they are and there's also like side detector things so like I know there's one where a guy gets killed and you've got to track them the blood through exactly, and up the, the and new find that. Exactly, the system in the game. Um, mm. And I must say, it, it's actually, I was a bit worried with the size of the game, but it actually worked out. It, that, the way they've implemented the first game of this kind that I've ever played, where I'm actually not getting frustrated and moving from one, one location to the other. Great, yeah. So well, as I said, looking go, go forward check to it, out. I cannot it wait. Cool. Uh, our, uh, one of our uh, long-standing reviewers, Dan, uh, he had the pleasure of reviewing it for PS3, and I mean, he gave it 90 out of 90 out of 100. Uh, we've had a lot of arguing about our review scores lately on the on the site and exactly what what mean what does a number mean and uh, giving a subjective opinion on review. But uh, 90 out of 100 means it's good, guys. Yeah. So well, <laughs> you should probably no, look, go check it out. If, if you if you enjoy this type of game, you will not be disappointed. Mm-hmm. You really will enjoy it. I don't normally enjoy these kind of games, and I am. So I can I mm-hmm. can see how the Great. guys would. So cool. Um, all right, uh, move on a tiny bit. Um, this new. <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't call this an app, but it's a new device that's going to be coming out from some guys that we picked up, uh, I think I got it through actually Google+. Plus. Um, it's called a jawbone that they're busy talking about. And this thing, it looks quite boring when you look at it. It's just a bracelet. Um, but what it actually is, it's, it's basically going to be tracking your, your fitness and stuff like that. You put the bracelet on, it's Bluetooth. On your phones, you get an app as well. Um, so then what you do is each meal you take a photo of, and it will actually work out what the calories for that meal are. Uh, sorry, this jawbone thing. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know how that works. It's Bluetooth, and um, as you move, how does the photo thing work? Can you well, explain magic. that to me? Magic. Yeah. I don't know. If Steve <laughs> well, Jobs' uh, last gift he bestowed upon the world AI, was uh, calorie photo counting via photographics. Yes. Um, and basically, what you'll do is you take a photo. It's going to send it. Look, it's not going to do it on your phone. It's going to send it back to a server. The server is just they've collated tons and tons of pictures of food and colors and all the rest of it. And look, it won't be always a hundred percent, but it'll be close enough. Um, and look, if you take a photo of a chocolate bar, they know a chocolate <laughs> bar is on average X. And it will detect certain foods and stuff. The same way they do facial recognition. It's it just, mm-hmm. they feed a lot of data, they tell it what it is, 
and then from this, and look, as, as time goes by, we should, should also improve. Sure. Uh, so whenever you have, make a mistake, they might then get a human to go in and work out and then tell the computer. Um, and then what's quite nice about the bracelet is also as you're moving, it's detecting your movement and feeding that via Bluetooth back to your phone into that app. So you then also know how many, how many calories you burnt compared to how much you've eaten. And I must say, I've got a friend who's very into his fitness and tracking exactly what he's doing and all the rest of it. And he's going to love this. And uh, what I also liked about it was the, uh, I'm not sure there was a technical term for it, but um, basically it'll uh, wake you up at the right time. Basically when your sleep pattern is very light and you set the alarm to within a certain, so I want to get up at 8 in the morning. And if your sleep patterns are light at half past 7, it just vibrates and wakes you up. Oh, and that's also cool. it doesn't wake up your partner. No. Uh, there are apps like that on yeah. the Android and, and Apple um, iOS markets, but <clears throat> they, they're on your phone and you need to actually have the phone on the bed with you. And I don't Hazardous. like having my phone next to my head. What, what we also find is quite reason. often is if you, you know, the two of you in the bed, um, the one person's movement actually affects it. Exactly. So if, uh, like I know with me and Celia, I tend to be up later. So it actually recalls the fact that she's gone to sleep way later than she actually did because it's actually picking me up. Mm. And when she wakes up, you know, if I had another one, it would then pick up the fact. So there are those problems as well, where I can imagine if it's on your wrist, it's as you're yes. moving. Um, and it works quite nice. And apparently that when you wake up, it actually makes quite a huge difference. Definitely, as you wake yeah. easy, you don't feel as grumpy as yeah, most of us normally do when we wake up. <laughs> um, sure, sorry. Bit of dead air there. Um, also, we're now talking about iOS and phones. There was this guy, uh, Charlie, who discovered the scary f- thing in iOS, which was quite interesting. You know, Apple, sorry, we got to rag on Apple a bit. Highly secure system, goes through the app store, nothing in the app store that hasn't been checked and ma- made sure it is. He managed to get an app in there that once it's on your phone can remotely go get a malicious payload, mm-hmm. pull it on your phone and get access to the full phone. Yep. The, the, I mean, this is something I've noticed just in uploading our apps to, to the app store mm-hmm. um, is that you can, there, there are many things that you can change after it's been uploaded. Um, so, you know, it, it, for example, they were, they actually rejected uh, an update for the My Broadband app mm-hmm. um, that I put on uh, recently um, because the metadata was incorrect. We, we had recently, you know, changed our, our site over from, from one system to another. Yeah. And so our contact page was pointing to a different URL. And it rejected the app based on the meta. The metadata is not even in the app. It is completely configurable from the back end of your, of your little developer account, okay. right? So you get your app approved, then you can go back and just change the metadata. Though this was the original app. Yes. Ha- so had, the, the app the, just, the, just makes a remote procedure call, as yeah. it were. Um, and it, may, it, it basically it implemented a security flaw in the JavaScript. And apparently in the latest version, they, they, they allowed the JavaScript to run at a lower layer. So basically in C to get more speed through it, basically for the browsing and all the rest of it. And in that, they unfortunately didn't, uh, sandbox it enough um, cool but you know got yep. through. Uh, the biggest problem that a lot of people complain about is that they kicked the guy out of the uh, dev, dev uh, yes. developer and, and he's, he's a researcher and, yeah, and he, he told them he hasn't released the thing he's told them and said by the way I will be releasing in X amount of time but here, here you've got time to fix it now go, go sort it out um, but just the fact that he managed to actually get the app in there and prove them wrong they, they got a bit upset with him yes <laughs> and I always say that's a bit stupid because you don't want to piss these guys off because next thing he's doing you a, like you didn't pay him to do this yeah like he's helping you improve your service so but but this isn't the first time that Apple is being hauled over the coals for treating their developers with scorn so yeah uh, they, they need to be careful uh, when you alienate your developer community the developer community is what what's making them so strong at the moment just nobody can hold a candle to the, the sheer armada yeah. of apps that they've got um so, and that's, I mean, they're, they're like the World of Warcraft of the smartphone business. There's just so many people <laughs> on their platform developing for it that, um, you know, that it's, that it's difficult to compete. Well, it's too, well, look, I must say, they, they still, even though they, they've pissed a lot of people off, they still get a lot of people developing, and the people are going to keep on developing it because that's where a lot more of the money yeah, is. Yeah, it's, it's going to take a lot to have people defect on mass, that's for sure. What's more likely, though, is what will happen is next time you'll get it into the app, st- app store. And he won't tell you before he releases the hack. <laughs> but anyway, um, going 
going from that. You want to talk about Viacom, how devastated they are about piracy. I, and I just, I just poor, thought poor, 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 poor Viacom. Viacom poor, and their CEO that's yeah. doing so badly. The, this you have is, to read out the headline. Yeah, this is just really about the headline, and then I'll give some background. Um, but yeah, Viacom so devastated by piracy that the CEO only gets a 50 million raise this year. Uh, oh, that's yeah. US dollar. Oh, woe is him. Shame. <laughs> Last year, he, he got a 50.5 million raise. No, no, apparently it's an increase of 143 percent or something like that compared to last year <laughs> interesting sorry i just i brief scanned through that all right sorry the, the the stat i saw in the article was that the previous year he had received okay. a 50.5 million i could be wrong but so uh, yeah. that's what they meant by devastated is uh, uh he lost is, what it, is that he didn't get three hundred thousand. yeah anyway um but what's interesting here is viacom uh took youtube they might have an argument here but viacom it's it, it's sort of like the pot calling the kettle black so Viacom took Google to court over YouTube, and their argument was that YouTube became the dominant video platform on the web because of piracy. And so YouTube owes Viacom money for all the content that YouTube users have pirated and put on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and Google said no, A, <laughs> and B, uh, even if that is the case, then maybe we need to bring some sanity to your mathematics. I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but it was hundreds of millions of is dollars. Is this the one where they were damages. asking for more money than there was sort of in the world? There was one of those. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, it was basically <laughs> something like that. It, it was a ridiculous well, amount American of money. You can just print some more money. In. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they get, they're getting there soon. Yeah. But Viacom run, runs their own video site called Spike.tv. And so what a lot of YouTubers did was that they, they went, okay, this is going to be easy. Went into Spike.tv and there is a, a uh, a famous among geeks uh, vlogger and um, musician called Jonathan Colton. For those who are unfamiliar with, unfamiliar with Jonathan Colton's work, he wrote the very famous theme song to Portal, um, and okay. then subsequently Portal Two. Um, the whole "This is a Triumph" um, huge success cool. song that cool. GLaDOS sings, and Jonathan Colton put a video on YouTube under the um, cr under a Creative Commons license. Mm -hmm. But it required attribution, and it required non-commercial use. Viacom lifted that video, put it on Spike.tv, and slapped their ads on it. So Good I mean, yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think part of also what came out. I remember this this the whole court case here is that um, Viacom had been secretly uploading videos onto YouTube of their con their, their own content well, they, onto YouTube yeah. from from but as different user accounts, but they managed to track it back by the IPs because they had they. Actually, we're doing it from the building yes. next door. Yes, Google did mention this, and, and Viacom wasn't the only company who did this. Um, but I mean, it was. I think it was great for Google because these companies trying to game the system to prove that they were right helped Google improve their filter mm. to the extent that we know how good it is. Okay. Like, if we even have a snippet of music in one of our videos on a show it like this, it gets flagged. I must say, the, the content system is incredible. Um, you can, like, uh, you know, even sometimes show a quick part of a video in the middle of a show that's in a screen. And they actually pick it up from that. Yep. Um, uh, it's, I know somebody else that actually works in the TV industry, they're actually talking about how good it is. I think it was to the point that like in a news channel, you get that video at the back, mm -hmm. that small screen. It will pick up content from there as long as it's been registered with YouTube. Hmm. Wow. That, that yeah, it's got ridiculously good. Um, but it's it's amazing what they're doing. Sorry, we, we were at this thing. They'll give me a whole talk on YouTube and how much they're pushing this thing and all the systems they've implementing implementing yeah. for it. And it's and, and amazing. unfortunately, it is important. Uh, this is a, a topic that um, I'm I'm starting to cover more and more on my broadband. <clears throat> is the licensing issues we face in markets as insignificant as South Africa, mm. and the fact that we've got we've got guys like Steam and um, and the Android market and Avi, you know Nokia, Avi Store and um, BlackBerry. App World and those guys that are selling their apps and games, um, you know, to the South African market yeah. with what seems to be no hitch. Um, and we've got Nokia selling music through their music store with no hitch. And yet um, there are guys who are struggling to get their stuff here. Samsung, uh, notably, with their music Apple. hub service. Apple with iTunes, probably more notably than Samsung. Um, that, that just, you know, and, and why is that? What kind of, you know, what kind of licensing concerns are they? Um, but things like this that Google have to do, um, you know, proving to content providers, listen, we're not just going to allow people to wantonly pirate your stuff because mm. these guys are worried about it. When, in fact, offering your stuff, I would argue, offering your stuff DRM-free for an acceptable price will just 
that that'll get you the sales. You don't have to slap massive amounts of DRM on it to prevent. Well, and a lot of the time, it. the guys are going to just bypass the DRM and release it somewhere where you can't control it. Yeah, and all these guys have to mm. release CDs. They they all release albums and stuff, and that is probably the the best place to get to pirate your music from. Mm. You you rip it as a uh, in a lossless format, FLAC, um, and it's perfect. You can burn CDs from that. Um, yeah. no, no. So uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> moving swiftly along. Um, I don't know if if you wanted to cover uh, Tegra Three and Luma Arcade. Is it because Derek w- was going <laughs> to give us the lowdown on Tegra Three? I, I just I looked at some of the specs, and one of the guys in the office who's very excited about this, chatting about some stuff. But do you want to just give us a rundown what what it is, what's sure. in it? Okay, well, Tegra Three is the new uh, architecture from Nvidia. Um, mobile, so mobile CPU swap, CPU GPU combo chipset, sort of all the interesting bits that actually handle the processing. Um, yeah, it's a major step up from the uh, original, um, the original Tegra Two. I think they said something I was reading. So it's about five times the speed improvement. Well, okay, look, that is, that is what a, you do. Yeah, it depends, depends what you do, and that is a claim from Nvidia. So you yeah. always take those with a pinch of salt. However. Um, You've increased the core clock speed, so um, it's now up to, I think, 1.3 or 1.4 gigahertz, depending on what you're doing. It's got its own turbo boost function, um, up from 1 uh, gigahertz. And it's also a quad-core processor rather than a uh, dual-core processor, so you've doubled the core capacity. Um, Actually, it is what you'd call a five-core processor, because beyond the quad, beyond the four main cores, you've actually got what's called a companion core. Um, The companion core is purely there for low-power... I had the guy in the office explain wh- why you want this, and it's more for like, – because this is going to come out on tablets and stuff like that. And when you're basically just doing some basic stuff, it's basically going you know, to switch all the other four cores off and run yeah. on this fifth core, which is running at, I think, 500 megahertz. Yeah, it's running at a, it's running a lower core clock. Um, they haven't quite finalized that or whatever, but 500 megahertz is a figure that's been thrown out there. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because this core is actually powerful enough to do – quite a few day-to-day tasks relatively Mm, mm. easily and what happens is the fifth core is actually made on a different um, process Uh, 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 it's more efficient it's better suited to low voltage um, scenarios Um, and because of this uh, you've got the power to uh, say run full HD video 1080p full HD video on purely the uh, companion core which is actually really impressive Um, it also extends the battery life to two or three times longer than uh, original Tegra 2 devices and yeah the second you you need that extra grunt, uh, it switches from the companion core to the four main cores, and uh, you're ready to go. And the the power of this device is actually really impressive. I mean, uh, the screenshots just coming out of games that it can run is just impressive. Yeah, I know it's it's quite. I know they were saying this is actually going to be mm-hmm. as powerful, exceeding some modern day PCs. Well, okay, not quite exceeding, L- like them, but on yeah, but I'm on, not looking on top end. Yeah, devices. no, on uh, in comparison, it's actually. Uh, the Tegra, the Tegra 3 um, chipset combo is actually comparable to low-end netbooks and uh, really low-end uh, laptops in terms of what it can do power-wise. And that's actually threatening, it's, it's really threatening the laptop market because why, why would you go for a laptop or a netbook when you've got this sort of power with the addition of a touchscreen? My, my main argument to that, though, is I would still say you want to be out, and, and most people would want to be able to run a proper operating system. So be that, and at some point, you will be able to run Linux on it, but Windows as yet until 8 is properly out and mm. available on ARM. You still can't run. So you can do that. Um, I still don't see this thing there. Um, I know Hawkeyes um, basically is running the Acer Transformer, uh, and it works great for it's certain just, things. Yeah. Um, but I would imagine there's like certain things I want to do like now I've got multiple tabs open um, and admittedly there's more power users so but like if I give this to my folks and they want to open up a browser quickly and there's certain things they want to do that they're used to they can't run the applications that they're used to so I would still say for the next year or two it will be a threat there amongst the geek guys but I still see there's limitations in this no, there's, there's definitely limitations, and it's more on the OS side rather than the hardware side. Mm. I mean, the hardware is jacked up. The hardware is waiting for the OS, the software, to catch up on it, really. Um, although people like Apple, uh, as much as much Apple hate as there is out there, Apple can dumb things down quite easily. Apple can make things basic. Apple can <laughs> um, allow your parents, your parents' parents, oh, no, to pick uh, the uh, device yeah. up and go for it. And the software will get to a point where they can pick the device up and do any amount of power user tasks. The, the CPU power is there or it will, it will be there within the next two, two cool. or three years. No, no, that's I agree. So in two years' time, it, who needs a netbook? Yep. I was just thinking, I, like I'm, I'm in the market now to get my folks a netbook. 
they're moving down to the coast, father is retiring, so I want to give them something that he can work on down there and, you know, he can Skype through and all those things. Mm -hmm. And I did think about possibly a tablet, but it's like there's certain apps that I'm, they're going to want to run or do and just the netbooks or the, the Android apps or even iPads just aren't quite at that point yet. So I'd actually have to still, I would imagine, get them a PC. Yeah. Uh, and it's more, I wish I could just give them that because the battery life on those things is going to be beautiful. Yes, yes, it will. Um, the battery life, is, speaking of that, for Tegra 3 is, because of the companion core, it's uh, really up there. And in tablets like the Asus Transformer, Pri uh, Transformer Prime, uh, this is now the follow-up. It's actually just officially been announced um, spec-wise spec yesterday. Um, things like that are actually going to be brilliant in terms of completely taking over the network market while having that benefit of massive amounts of power. The Transformer Prime has a claimed 12-hour battery life um, in itself while running 1080p video uh, on the, on the companion core, which is quite impressive, mm. but the uh, other draw of the Transformer Prime is that it also has the uh, sort of docking station, which extends the battery life by another six hours. So you potentially have a netbook that can run for a good 18 hours solid. As in, so yeah, solid usage. Solid usage, which is, which is, hmm. which is quite impressive. Sure, you won't, be, you won't be gaming and pushing that thing to mm. the max, but for everyday tasks, you're on a flight and you want to watch a movie, it's stuck on a, Yeah, I, that's my, my, my primary usage is stuck on a flight, mm. yeah. you can fly all the way to America and not have to recharge it once. Um, somebody was just asking why not getting my folks a desktop. Um, and the advantage of this is they're going to be traveling now. Um, and while they're there, I want them to be able to have something they can walk down. It sounds odd, like to the bowling club, <laughs> open it up, you know, record scores, anything like that. I can get a, a SIM card slotted into it. So they've got 3G where they are. They don't need to go get ADSL and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, which where they're moving to, there is no ADSL. Um, and it's just the whole portability. And it would actually work out cheaper than buying a desktop. You know, desktop is maybe two grand, three grand. Yeah. Then you add a screen and a keyboard. I can buy a nice little netbook for slightly less than that. And I'm looking like a decent, decent net netbook. Sure. No, definitely. Look, uh, the desktop always has its place. Um, it will inherently be far more powerful because uh, yeah. it doesn't have to deal with the size constraints. But I think the uh, the battery life and the portability is a good, uh, it's a good trade-off mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. what you need. Cool. Um, you wanted to also mention the bulldozer. Uh, right. Bulldozer. And Luma Arcade. I don't know where that. Sorry, uh, Luma Arcade <coughs> actually fits into the Tegra 3 thing. Um, there was a story run on Engadget today, actually. And the reason that's significant is because Luma Arcade is actually a South African development studio. So maybe you should handle that from, from here. But the, they, were, they were mentioned on Engadget as part of the Tegra 3 um, stuff. Well, uh, I'd handle it from here if I'd actually caught that story. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you can just tell them about Luma Arcade and, and sure, Blade, I mean, Blade Slinger or okay, whatever it's uh, called. Okay, is it, is it Blade Slinger? Yes, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, basically Luma Arcade's new uh, mobile game. Um, it, it's looking very impressive. Uh, it really pushes uh, the iPhone you know, quite significantly. You can go find some videos uh, on the net. And uh, you know, it, it really does not look like an iPhone game. You look at it and you think maybe that was a PS2 generation or you know, maybe an, an older game from you know, 2004 or something like that. It's looking quite cool. And what's nice about it is um, obviously being an iPhone game or uh, iPad is all gesture based. So uh, they're doing some really interesting things with the gestures. Uh, yeah, instead in of having of, it. Instead of having you know, terrible first person shooter controls that you, know, you really can't do with just your thumbs while holding a touch device, you're going to be doing some more interesting things. Oh, that's, that. that's pretty cool. I must say, so a lot of them are very. You can Clumsy see just, they're just the yes. yeah. yeah. I, I hate first-person shooters on touch devices, mm -hmm. unless they're on rails and very simple, which is you know something you can just kill time with. There's no point in having an in-depth shooter on yeah. a touch yeah. device. Yeah. And <clears throat> and I mean, like we've we've tried to play these. Uh, Dungeon Defenders is one thing that's come to PC that I think mm. is it plays much more comfortably than trying to you know ha trying to mangle two touch points on a screen. Um, you know, trying to maneuver it like like you would a, uh, an and analog then, controller. And then select your weapons, and there's there's way too much going on in that game for it to be conducive on a tiny little touch screen. Yeah, yeah. And now what's interesting here is that it seems that Nvidia is using Luma Arcade's graphical developments on mobile to punt Tegra. Um, so they they uh, in, they made it onto Engadget today, which is a huge international technology blog. Yeah, right. really um, cool. And so yeah, that bodes well for local game development. I think uh, mm. if they see what kind of rocking stuff we can come up with in South Africa. Cool. Uh, so, so, since you mentioned somebody else that got mentioned overseas on the blogs, Hack for House also got mentioned during the Google Android Day. I uh, think I, I, was, saw I don't know if it's engagement or. Uh, one of the hacker. One it of was in Gadget, blogs. I think. Um, and basically, they did a via Google, um, well, Hangout, where you could actually control the video, and then they also had another laser, okay. which you could control at the same time. 
So you, you'd have like a laser that you could move around where the guy was busy having his video stuff. Actually, very, very cool what they're doing. Um, if you haven't checked out Hack for House, go, go check them out. House Keep wanting to call them. <laughs> House for Hack. Go, go check them out as well. <laughs> very cool. I know they were tweeting about uh, the, 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 how much the, the bandwidth and hits went up uh, just with that mention. Yeah, I can believe it. Cool. Uh, bulldozer, sorry. Right, Bulldozer. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's going to go down as one of the biggest fails in computer it? history. It's, it's terrible <laughs> to say, and there's, there's a lot of fanboys out there who... Can I call them fanboys? Or they are fanboys. But um, there's a lot of fanboys out there who are defending it to the ends of the earth. But at the end of the day, Bulldozer is is to AMD what NetBurst was to uh, Intel. Mm -hmm. NetBurst was the old Pentium 4 architecture, which, uh, pre was, which was pretty much defined as too hot, not, not fast enough. It was just slower than the competition, and it couldn't really compete. The only reason it managed to compete at all is because uh, Intel just marketed that through to the ends of the earth. I mean, as Chipsilla, Intel... Intel and Intel, people to. tend to trust Intel and buy it just because... Exactly, just because Intel's always been there yeah. and they are the bigger company, so you just go for it. Which is a bit sad because I'm, I'm a bit of a... I do like AMD, you know, yeah. but both have the advantages. But, I, you know, I want both to be competitive because course, it brings prices down for both. Yeah, no, being being competitive is the best thing um, mm. the best thing for, for this market. I, I, I personally am a performance fanboy. Whatever gives me the best performance, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm right there with that. I'm right there with that platform. And also what has more long longevity now um, with bulldozer bulldozer's main um, draw or at least what so AMD I just want to mention just in case you're not bulldozer is the new yeah it's uh, the new AMD architecture yes. the, the high end chip is the 8150 I think it is the FX 8150 and um the, the main draw that AMD is trying to punt now, because AMD really hyped up the performance of Bulldozer. They, to they told everyone, listen, it's going to absolutely cream the competition, and it'll be out now. And then a few months later, it should be out, and a few months later, and it just experienced massive delays until by the time it had come out, the competition had completely overtaken it, and Bulldozer's performance just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't up, up to scratch. scratch. wasn't up to scratch. I mean, in, it, with gaming in, with gaming in, uh, in mind... Um, Bulldozer is on average slower than the competition. Uh, Intel's, Intel's similarly priced offering, the uh, Core i7-2500K, uh, the unlocked version, that actually beats Bulldozer in most uh, benchmarks. Embarrassingly for AMD, now Bu Bulldozer is a new architecture. It was built from the ground up. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a advancement of previous, okay. uh, previous architecture. Cool. Now, and because of that, there, there, were, some, there were some issues yep. with it. Yeah. They couldn't quite uh, squeeze as much performance out of it as they needed to. And because of that, AMD's last generation CPU use, uh, most notably the last generation high-end one, I think it's the 1100T, Black Edition, that actually outperforms the new bulldozer CPUs in some scenarios. And that's not something that's you want. You don't want your old generation, <laughs> old, old generation hardware because to be why, why would people buy new why, why would Sounds like the Pentium 3. Yes. yes. <laughs> Pentium, <laughs> well, exactly the same thing. That, that's where the similarity to NetBurst comes in. Pentium 3 actually outperformed the initial Pentium 4 architect, uh, uh, architecture based on NetBurst uh, for this exact same reason. So, bulldozer... It's not really. It's not really the chip to upgrade to. Okay, so avoid, avoid, avoid it for now. Avoid it for now. But um, also, with all these things, go go check out the specs. Yeah, go check out the specs marks. and see. Maybe if you get a good deal on it, it's it's worth a shot. Um, and AMD says, look, by the time Windows 8 comes out, Bulldozer's performance will increase. Um, it's it's got to do with low level. Um, so, uh, low-level software um, within the operating system. Um, Windows 7 can't utilize all eight cores and Bulldozer as effectively as AMD would want it to. That's safe for Windows 8. Uh, so buying a Bulldozer now in the hopes that when you upgrade to Windows 8, you get more performance. That's, that's uh, one of the things, however, uh, yeah. by the time Windows 8 is out, <laughs> Intel's new technology will yeah. be out, and hopefully AMD will have a more competitive offering. So there isn't really a point to Bulldozer at this point Wait. in time. Cool. All right. Uh, Darknet. Right, so that's interesting. I actually got I got a private message on Twitter from these mm -hmm. guys, and I didn't end up joining their little uh, their little IRC chat because, well, it made me nervous. It, it almost looked like one of these random, you know, hacker bots um, that send, spam people th that spam people trying to get them to click on links <laughs> that that are malicious. And uh, what these guys want to do um, is they feel that uh, the, the internet as it is right now is uh, is busy, you know, uh, you know, it's busy, you know, corporate and government control and blah blah blah, and um, and so they want their own. They want a network that's going to be free of no. um, of these things, and so it actually looks. I want to ask you some questions. Sure. Is, is this? Uh, I see you said a global work. Now, is this a a separate network, or, or is this like another one of those like free net? It's a peer-to-peer -peer VPN network that runs on top 
of the internet? Okay, so that's a good question. And I, I don't see those questions answered in, uh, I mean, I should have in retrospect just joined that RSC channel so that I could figure out what these guys were doing. So I picked up on the article on, um, on uh, RS Technica and the, the, from what it, it looks like, it's, they want a, a mesh access point. So it looks like they want to go wireless and then if you want to go global, then you have to get undersea capacity. Um, so I'm not entirely sure, you know, how they how they're going to get this. It, it's a it's a um, they they call it. Let me let me uh, yeah. let me re- re- read this whole sentence. Um, oh no, sorry. The uh, operation uh, uh, anonymous previously did something similar called Operation Mesh, mm. and that was quite short lived. That didn't make it. So this is. I mean, a very similar kind of operation. It sounds like they they want to do a mesh network, um, and they want to. And they want to, uh, you know, they want it to be free and open and all those beautiful things, which the internet largely still is. I mean, there are net neutrality concerns. Um, Look, I must say, lo- largely still is, but you can see there is a, it's tending towards more oversight yes. as time goes by. So I do envision at some point one of these big VPN mesh- meshes are going to start working and we're all eventually going to use it. I, I just can see that. My, my concern with that, there is a certain undesirable content that the, a lot of these guys use this for. Yes. Um, and that was, I mean, Darknet now uh, brings up memories of a very recent bust on a so-called Darknet yeah. node or cluster that had child pornography on it. Yeah. Um, and that's what this was used for, was, was for distribution of this, of this illegal content. Having said that, I still don't think that that should be a reason to ban this or, or not do this. Yes. Um, because you, that element will always exist, but it will always be the smallest minority, and, and from my experience, is generally guys when they find it, on average, go out to stop it and bring these people out to the authorities. Yes. Um, my, my concern though is this, if they want to do this on a, like a work thing, I, it's not going to work because as soon as it's large enough, the government's going to still step in. So the only way this will work is on a VPN peer-to-peer meshed type system. Sure, but what prevents... What prevents deep packet inspection? What prevents ISPs from eventually throttling certain types of VPN traffic or uh, VPN traffic from certain sources? I mean, like if this does not run on its own network, then it can still be controlled. You control to a point, so you would have. You to can't block control the content, yes. but you control the flow. Um, of the, but with a lot of this content, you can traffic. make it look like HTTP traffic, and you can. There's ways of getting around that. Deep packet inspection only works if the thing's not encrypted. If yes. it's encrypted, you you. you can't see what's in there, but like I know torrents are fairly easy to spot because of there's a nature behind the traffic. Yes. But what has happened in, in current days, they've actually started to make that torrent stuff look more like normal traffic, which has actually stuffed a whole bunch of things up. So there are ways of getting around this. And if you can get enough people using it and saying, we want this to work, and is use an ISP, you don't let this work, well, I'm going to another ISP. That, that's the way yeah. to get around well, that, this. That's sort of my argument you know, again, you know, it'll, it's good to to see initiatives like this, but I, I think it's maybe overly paranoid. Maybe the people, you know, are maybe what they're really scared of is is being monitored rather than the the internet itself becoming less free. It's becoming less private. Now yes. that is a concern I can fully understand. Yeah. But I mean, right now, if my ISP does not you know, grant me access to certain content, like we were discussing it in the office today, um, Telcom actually blocks access to a certain website. Oh, um, right. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, like, it, it seems to be. I mean, I'm, I don't want to say anything on the record right now because, I mean, it, it'll require, like, a, a lot I, more I, investigation. I'll to be check able to with you which website because most of the websites I need to get to, I can still get to. Yes, so, it, and this is a legit above-board website, fairly stock standard thing. It's just very strange that it, it doesn't load. And if an ISP does not get me what I want, I'll just go to another ISP that does. Yeah. And this is what's, this, the, what's been happening in the United States when people are, are calling for caps or when you know, the, big, the big networks are saying, listen, we, we're going to stop uncapped offerings. We're going to mm. give you offerings instead with enormous caps, 100 gigs, 200 gigs of cap. Um, because Americans didn't have a concept of what it means to be capped and what you can do with 100 gigs of data, you know, um, th- th- they, they freaked out about this. And, but there were, very quickly, there were smaller operators very willing it, to say, come. we're doing, we, you can, you can S- use as S- much as you like. Sell Yeah. 
Um, and or, or in our case, MWeb uh, and, yeah, and yeah, the I'm, Internet I'm thinking, Solutions yeah. based uncapped providers. Yeah. So, um, I mean, when it's uncapped, and we all know it's uncapped, even in the States. I mean, the, the only thing they've got there is they've just got much more capacity and, well, and they, in, they, in the local loop than we've got here. Megabits per second and stuff like that. So, the uncapped is. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're starting to struggle, apparently, from, from the reports I've read on, on places like Ars Technica. They're starting to struggle with the kind of congestion problems <laughs> we've, we've seen a long time ago here already. Um, but it's not nearly uh, as bad. Yeah, I must say with a lot of that thing, a part of that is also, well, the ISPs not upgrading as much as they should upgrade. Sure. So To, to, to meet demand. But yeah. also their argument is, is that if we invest in, in more infrastructure, we're not getting more on data revenue then, I mean, there's no real incentive to, in, to invest. The, uh, I mean, regardless, I mean, yeah. the, the, the bottom line is, is that if, an IS, if one ISP says, um, for example, there's talk of people throttling things like ne Netflix and Hulu, fine, I'll go to somebody who's not throttling yes. Netflix okay. and Hulu. Um, I think this concern is more, more also though, for, sorry, we're hopping on this a bit, is like in America now you have the government, they're starting to remove certain DNS domains. Sure. And, and gov go, that's government from government ordered removals yes. you're talking about. Removal. Yes. And they're starting to worry the, the censorship through that. And that's and happened this, because that's happened through activists, two activist groups yeah. and two guys like WikiLeaks, mm. um, where effectively the, the server is still up, but nobody can get to it because the DNS records are removed. Um, and then also, those, you know, in certain countries, they wanted to have these blacklists that people can block. Yes, um, but then refused to say what's on the list. And there was talk the of that in South Africa, and uh, the ISPs kicked and screamed against it. And you know, it comes up as a general policy discussion thing, and it gets screamed against, and then things quiet down for a bit. And and one worries about these things because they're not being discussed in the open. I must say, uh, it was quite nice. Uh, not this year, but the year before, we had Dave McClure and Peter Coronas on to talk about it, who the heads of respectively or were of the Australian ISP and the American one. And they're talking about, you know, everybody says like Australia, look, they're doing it and they're implementing it. And they say, no, they're not. Every time they implement, the system falls over. You cannot handle the load. Um, and that's the argument of our ISPs is that putting that burden on them is just going to cause a cost that they're going to have to pass on to yeah. the end user. Yeah. Um, and it shouldn't really be, however, now this is where, our, we, actually we should move on from this and discuss it at a later date, sure. but um, I had some very interesting comment from a lawyer, there is an article up in my broadband, you can go look at it, um, regarding net neutrality, the question came up when Telcom launched Uncapped, and they mentioned the fact that they've got deep packet inspection working, we covered this at the my broadband conference as well on my panel, um, but uh, yeah, there's the, some very interesting comment that I got from a lawyer on the topic as well, so South Africa's legislation um, is, a, if they want to make changes to this, they're going to have to provide. The ISP is also saying, you know, you're making this our problem, but you're not getting giving us anything in return. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, everything about the way that's regulated will have to be looked at before it can become a reality. Cool. All right, let's just move on a bit more. Um, Wild Tangent launches Android app rental service. Once again, Jan. <laughs> I know nothing about this one, sorry. Yeah, ach, it's just a... It's just a uh, game rental service it looks like so it's it's app rentals it's android app rentals but it's just games at the moment so um games um already available they they said is doodle jump fruit ninja kona's crate air attack hd call of duty modern warfare 2 and raging thunder um well, so the thing with this though most of those games are fairly cheap yes so we're talking about it's not like a fruit ninja's Two, three dollars. It's, it's not quite like, I mean, a console game rentals where you would maybe be interested in getting the game for a weekend, playing it through and giving it back. Like Modern Warfare, yeah. for example, has got a four or six hour single player. You can nuke that in a weekend and give it back and you're like, cool, I, I had the single player and that was great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so here, Fruit Ninja is a game that you play in queues. Uh, and stuff like that. So I don't know quite what the business model is going to be. Um, I mean, this kind of stuff isn't really available to South Africa. It's just interesting to see these trends uh, coming through. And console game rentals are very popular. Um, I don't know how popular they are locally. I mean, you see BT Games taking second-hand games and reselling them. But I don't see them uh, really being rented except through places like video stores. Cool. I haven't really seen I've seen the, the rental in video stores, but that seems to have died down yeah, a bit. But like overseas, Play.com and those guys, I mean, it's huge where um, it's actually sort of peer-to-peer peer video game rentals and sales that, that these sites facilitate um, and, uh, and that's, that's great cool. um, so yeah it's going to be interesting to see you know, what happens with this especially if bigger games make it to mobile platforms at least maybe what they do is what you do is you pay a monthly fee and you can have one of these games live on your phone at a time or two yeah, like these streaming services we've already yeah. started seeing um, for video games 
which cool. I'm not enamored with at all. <laughs> well, it's in this bandwidth in this country. <sighs> Never mind bandwidth. It's it's about uh, like the day I get paranoid. This is like to me, this is the beginning. It's the same thing about cloud services. I'm fine to give you stuff that I don't want. But if you can, like, uh, I mean, the whole story with Amazon Kindle revoking mm-hmm. George Orwell's books, yes, all, yeah. like that kind of stuff freaks me out. I, I don't want you to have control over my content like that. So, um, and, and of significant content. So games are still okay. And that's why I'm willing to concede to platforms like Steam and stuff. But when it gets to more serious so stuff. You, so you don't have a Kindle? I do have a Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> I also have physical books though. Yeah. And no, so I just, I'm saying the, the important is, books, you buy real copies uh, of. It's going to happen. No, but you buy them now. In sure. Five and then years we'll time have going what the, the Ministry of the Revision of History or whatever it was called in 1984, yeah. changing, uh, you know, going back and retroactively changing. Changing the history to be what they <laughs> want it to be. <laughs> well, it happens now. But anyway, um, also I see Adobe is decided not to support mobile flash plugins anymore. Yes. and it's very interesting. And the, the full comment out of that was the um, issuing flash in favor of HTML5. So you, Apple has won. Do you know what my big problem with this is? Streaming video. Yes. What we do now, um, our player is running off uh, a flash container, flash right? container, and it uses the dope flash thing, which doesn't work. There is a thing that Apple's done, which is like a pseudo HP streaming thing that only works on Apple devices. It's supposed to, I read something, it's supposed to work on Android, yeah. it doesn't. Mm. Um, well, what's wrong with a video tag? Can't you, uh, you can't, you can't do you stream? streaming video too. Mm. Yeah. That's the big time is how do you stream? Um, there is the thing that it supports. Uh, there's a, another – sorry, just we've looked at this quite a bit. Um, and for games and stuff like that, a lot of that you can actually port across to uh, hard, but you can accru- port across to HTML5. Streaming, there's no real defined standard that all the browsers support. Um, so I, I don't know what the solution for that is. Um, so I know currently on all Androids you can watch our streams because of the Doe plugin. So if they remove that – we're going to have to st- go and look at the whole thing. Did they explain why? Or did they just decide? I that's think it's that? not making and the money and they can see the writing on the wall and this is going to end. So it's just not worth supporting. Mm. So I do imagine eventually that mystery will. The thing is, we need a defined HTML5 streaming system. Um, you know, they start to take the. The Apple one is actually very cool. I've actually looked into how it works. It's actually deceptively simple how it works. And it actually basically what they do is take the video, as you send it to the server, it chops it up into lots and lots of small videos with a playlist. Okay. And then what you do is you actually play one video and the next video and the next video. And they and, just And just up. uses the HTML5 standard to mm-hmm. play that. Um, and then it works through all your proxy servers. Um, you can cache it. It actually works beautifully. It's a very beautiful system. But not everybody supports it and it's not part of the HTML5 standard. Yes. And the thing is that standard is evolving so quickly. I mean, I was, I was um, at, an, at an opera launch in Norway mm-hmm. Uh, a month or so ago and um, right there and then the guy unveiled a new discussion document that he had pre- that he wanted for CSS so he's like I want to import I want this in the CSS spec here's a sample imp- implementation in Opera to have paginated browsing we cool. discussed it in a, yeah. in a previous episode uh, and and those things are evolving so quickly and the, the browser makers have to prioritize which parts of the spec they implement, they implement yeah. and um, and which parts rather of discussion because the thing is the well, spec isn't even finalized in, when they've in, implemented features. I must say, in part of that, you know, part of this is actually the W three C's fault. The browser guys were going, "Come, let's let's move this spec along," and they're going, "No, no, we're going to do it this way." And there are a lot of people holding the spec, and the, the browsers eventually said, "Stuff you, we're going to start implementing this stuff." You will now match the spec to match <laughs> what, what we've you. done, <laughs> um, and we will retroactively. Fix the and th- this is part of what happened in the early days of HTML as well, when we had front page extensions and all kinds of junk, um, you know, that has polluted the web ever since. So it, it is an issue. Um, so that said, um, uh, just to get back to the Adobe story, Adobe has said that they want to that they're going what they what they're instead going to punt is instead of f- the Flash container, they're going to punt Air, and they're going to use Air as a cross-platform way. Of, of developing oh, applications. Okay, yeah. but they've also just said they're going to stop Air support for Linux. Was Air ever supported on Linux yes, officially? beautifully. Um, that's how I run TweetDeck. On, on yeah, Ubuntu. you could call it beautifully. You could also call it that I had to hack it onto a 64-bit Ubuntu install. Like <laughs> A tiny bit of hacking, but not, it's not that... <laughs> I had to go into the package, change the oh, no, uh, they dependencies. Fixed, they fixed that, they did get a bit, but they have <laughs> okay. all, all support. Um, one thing somebody did ask, isn't WebM that Google's 
talking about for that. WebM is a video codec. Yeah, it's codecs. So it's like H H two six four or I'm trying to think of something. And codecs uh, are important, but that's not a streaming codec. No, I think purely video codec. Yeah. And um, so, like, I know the current RTMP streaming can use the H two. We currently see with H two six four, and at LA says you might okay, be no, able to use the, the WebM. video tag needs to be able to use WebM, and that's streaming video, isn't it? When you go to YouTube and you click a video. I mean, technically, that video is streaming down, isn't it? No, but okay, yes, that's all using. A f okay, normally when you're using YouTube, you actually have a flash plugin to view it. Yes, all right. But on YouTube, YouTube has HTML5 support. Yes, using WebM. Yes. Now that what happens is you're actually using the HTML5 video tag tag. Yes, which allows you to watch non-streams. So non, when we're talking streaming, we're talking live streaming. Yes, like what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now. Um, there is a standard in there to watch videos. So if there's a video file on the server that you, you can watch it, and that you can do very easy with HTML5. Um, you can just pick your right codex. Cool. cool. That was the last story in our lineup. All right, just into a kicker. <laughs> um, and I, I haven't actually read through the thing, but this is just very cool. Some guy basically built a copter. Okay. Um, and you've actually got to check the picture. I don't know if the, the mixer can bring it up. Um, Okay, that's maybe it's coming not. up on the stream for the guys with video right now. Um, but basically, uh, it's a multi-copter. And you see the guy actually, uh, sorry, this thing on the stream is not, not the best picture. Um, but you see me, it's like on one of these exercise balls with a chi on top of it. With uh, one, two, three, four, no, five, six. No, it's a Pilates six. ball. So it's, I think it's four blades times four. Sixteen blades spinning all the way around him. Um, that takes off and it just man built themselves you can see busy taking off there that's just very cool very geeky that is great and an, an, an e-powered multi-copter i mean what on earth how is come it on it's, it's got to do with the who was it mtn <laughs> uh, vertical e-vertical integrated <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I love I love the uh, the Engadget article. Uh, the human death trap strike through multicopter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can I drive that to work? <laughs> Can you build me a landing pad at at the office? Perhaps I don't know. That'd be sweet. Mm. <laughs> you just need to make it smaller. Yeah, and then, then you can just land into a parking bay. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. What's the sort of range on that thing? I can't imagine very far. <laughs> <laughs> you, this, where would the fuel source be? That's that's the problem. Mm. Is you need a decent, maybe the ball. You actually like hollow out the ball, and that's oh, your, there you go, yeah, your, yeah. your petrol tank. <laughs> well, um, the nice thing is, it's actually electric powered. It's it, it doesn't use petrol at all. I remember I remember them writing about it. It's apparently electric powered. Oh, okay, and it's actually cool. quite impressive. Although that's going to limit your range quite yeah. severely. I mean, you can need a big battery. Um, oh look, that's electric powered. So amazing, it's taking yeah. off and flying. Yeah. All right, and with that, <laughs> uh, cool. I just want to say thank you again to James. We, where can people find you again? Uh, at mygaming.co.za, James underscore E underscore S on Twitter, and James at mygaming.co.za via email. Cool. Jan, do you want to buy broadband? I'm the staff writer at my broadband. <laughs> you can rage at me on the forums there. Mybroadband.co.za forward slash VB for the forum, forward slash news for what's relevant in the technology space in South Africa, um, and at JanVZA on Twitter. I'm also on Google+. Plus. I'm also on Facebook technically, but who checks that nowadays with Google Plus around? Cool. Right. Um, Derek. I'm sort of like a mix between my broadband and my gaming. Either it's Derek at mybroadband.co.za or Derek at mygaming.co.za. Today I do check both. Uh, grab me by email or on Twitter, uh, at Derek Kramer. Uh, the spelling's on the site. Everyone gets it wrong. So, <laughs> so check before so you check try. Before go you, to uh, yeah. Wiki.altinet. Uh, <laughs> it is on the right there, just guess. Cool. I'm myself, Tim Hawk. Uh, Twitter is... Tim underscore Hawk. Please go like us on Facebook. Just search for Let's Talk Geek on, and on Google Plus now. Under plus Let's one. Talk, Let's Talk Network. Plus one us. Add us to your circles. Um, and of course, uh, The Mixer. They who shall not be named because I'm actually in trouble for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just edit all that out of the recorded video. It was way before we recorded, so that, that's good. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks Th for having me. Cool.